can't talk loud. Can you hear me? So I guess I, I'm actually a loud talker too. So hi, my name is Karen Warren. Excuse my jacket. Of course I have a dress, so I'm um, I'm the, the chair, which means the moderator. I, they gave us a nice title for actually convening the session. But um, I'm uh, Karen Warren, and I'm going to get things started. I know people are going to drift in because we went over, but I have one job, and my job is to keep things on time, and I've already failed pretty much. But um, I think it's interesting to be doing this session not knowing what the keynote speaker was going to be like. So now we're jumping into stuff that we never even thought about or conceptualized when we were kids going through school, for sure. And I think I can say that comfortably for everybody in the room, regardless of age at this point and generation, because this is not stuff. I, I, I watched both of these presentations beforehand and wasn't even on the radar in terms of how you conceptualize the world. So we've got two speakers today talking about kind of doing cool stuff with new stuff. How's that for my, techno my technology term? And it's hard to imagine that, uh, that our kids and the kids coming up now are going to be expecting this is the norm for them. So um, without further ado, I'm not going to read you their bios. Their bios are in the thing. Um, and I'll let them introduce themselves. But I believe we're going to start with Beth today from Union County College. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to be here. My name is Beth ritter Guth, and I am the Director of Instructional Design and American Honors at Union County College. I was an English professor for 18 years, tenured in Pennsylvania. And uh, my passion is helping great teachers be better teachers. So I'm really excited to be here uh, to help you um, just learn about some things that you may not know about. My focus and my main passion is universal design. So you know when you go out for a walk, with your dog, and you see um, the corners of the street, or the corners of the sidewalk. They've, um, I don't know, in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, where I'm originally from, um, they've flattened them out so that people in wheelchairs can get up. That is universal design in a city. And that's saying, listen, we don't know if anybody on this block needs a wheelchair, but we know that there are people with wheelchairs that will need this kind of access to the sidewalk. The same concept is true in education. We have students with IEPs. We have students at the college level that need accommodations through the ADA. But why not give those accommodations to everybody? Why not say, listen, not everybody, I, I really don't like to watch long videos. I'd rather just have the, the transcript and read through it. Why not just give that to everybody? So Universal Design has um, three, three tenets. The first is the way that students receive the material. So if you have a YouTube video, you have a transcript right next to it. And in, in Google, I don't know if you know this, in YouTube, there is a transcript button right there that you can click and it'll grade transcript right away. You have to look through it just to make sure that it's right. But it's, it's pretty accurate in most cases. Um, so the way that students receive material, the way students manipulate material once they have it, and then um, the way they submit material. So I taught English, and in English I taught uh, American Romantics, which is uh, Henry David Thoreau, um, Walt Whitman, that era. So most of the time, people who teach that kind of literature, it's always read, discuss, write a paper, take a test. That's usually the format. And if you've had those kind of courses in college, that's probably what you did. Um, so what we've done in, in different, and we've done a lot of different things, one was use Second Life, which is a virtual world, uh, where students um, did the same kind of writing, the same amount of writing, but instead of writing it in an essay format, they wrote it in note cards on decorated Hawthorne's house or um, at Brown Poe's house of Usher. So they're still doing the same amount of work, they're still doing the same amount of writing, they're still being graded just on the writing, but they're delivering it to me in a different format, not in that same essay format. So I can't talk about everything that I love to do, but today we're going to talk about augmented reality, and um, one of the tools that we use is Erasmus. And augmented reality um, is using your mobile device and using an image and overlaying on top of it some other kind of content. It could be a movie, it could be a still image, it could be, um, it could be a PowerPoint, it could be anything. But you're using one thing, using your device to make that thing into something else. So it's a different way for students to receive material. It's a different way for students to interact with material. And then when they create Erasmus, when they create their auras, they're delivering to you different content in a different way. How many of you have talking too long? 
So here's the official definition of augmented reality, and you can read that on your own. Um, so does everybody have some kind of smartphone? Wave it in the air, let me see. Let me see your beautiful mobile device. Okay, if you don't have one, please sit by somebody who does. So we get to the juicy, fun stuff. Erasmus is just one of the many free augmented reality tools that are out there. Um, they do a lot of corporate stuff. They've done Rolling Stones. They've done a lot of different bands and stuff that if you hover your device over the image, um, a video will pop up or um, a commercial will pop up. So um, they have an education division, which is what we use. Um, it creates an image and an overlay, you add it to a channel, students subscribe to the channel, and then they use their smartphone. So we're gonna talk about Bird for Turtle. This is the fun part. It is National Turtle Week. I have two turtles at home box turtle and a snapping turtle. My box turtle is 65 years old. She's old, she eats macaroni and cheese. That's how she lived long. So, uh, so what we're gonna do is on your devices, please download the Erasma app. It's free, it's, um, it's on smartphone, it's on iPad, iPhone, Google. So take a minute to download that. You wanna create a free account. Do you have a turtle? We love the turtle. Okay, so we did a little review before, but for those who came in, um, what is Bert the Turtle? Who is Bert the Turtle? Where's the guy in the back? Speak really loudly. Um, is it similar to the fence um, propaganda movie from the 1950s? Instructing people how to use fire. Okay, so civil defense propaganda from the 50s, the duck and cover movie, this is a symbol for the duck and cover movie, you know, go to your fallout shelter. So if I were teaching history, and I wanted my students to learn about that propaganda, learn about the Cold War, learn about, um, learn about all the things that we did um, to prepare people for nuclear, uh, nuclear holocaust, you know, I would definitely want to talk about Bird the Turtle, right, and these movies. So, so everybody got the app? Raise your hand if you have it. All right, so the next thing that you want to do is you want to, up in the corner, there will be a search, a little magnifying glass for search. You want to search for CEN. And then you'll see Bird the Turtle. You want to follow that channel. So up in the corner, there will be a little magnifying glass. Click on that, you'll see the end. You'll see Bird the Turtle, and you'll click on that and follow that channel. Raise your hand when you've got it. If you need help, let me know. I'll be ready. I know, it's great. Raise your hand when you get it. You don't have to keep your hand up just so I can see. How are you guys doing over there? Not every All right, help your neighbors out if they're stuck. Again, if you don't have a smartphone, you don't get with somebody who does. Once you follow that channel, yes? So look at that app. What was the search for once again? Uh, C E N. I can't remember this name. I'm going to get it. And you'll see a picture of it. Teach us 
back. Everybody here teach back? All right, what do you teach? Computer science? They're just still looking at her. When you move, when you move away from the image, the video stops. Right. So it only plays if you're. It only plays if it sees the image, and you don't have to have a paper image. You could have an image on a computer anywhere the image can be, as long as the colors are clear. Now, if you make, if you take a picture like that. Something with a, like a really dark black background or dark or a bright white background, you can't get the color points. But it'll tell you in the software. I'm going to show you the software in a minute how it, how it works. It'll tell you if an image will work for the project. So you could use this for anything. If you teach math, you could have a math problem, and then the students hover over top over top to get the solution. Or they can do the solution using Screencast-O-Matic, which is a free screen capture tool. Um, or they can use Shofu, which is a free mobile app um, that records their, which records their um, work, and they can upload their movies on top of the image of a problem. So it's a fun way to deliver content. It's a fun way for students to deliver content back to you. And of course, they're manipulating something different. So it has all the tendencies of your person. All right. So let's learn how we make these. How are we doing on time? For, if you want to go on your devices to erasmo.com, open up a browser, go to erasmo.com. So it's really simple to make these. It takes all of five minutes to make them once you get the hang of it. So you need a picture and you need some kind of content. It doesn't have to be a video. It can be a still shot. It can be, um, it can be a document. It can be anything. So it doesn't have to be a video. Good. It's a little confusing when you go into Erasmo because it doesn't have a login button on the front screen. You have to actually go to customers.
So a handy trick to make sure that you're always complying with the law. Now, remember how I told you about too much white in the background? This might be very difficult for the Erasmus app to read, but we're going to see. We'll see. No, no, we're going to try it out. That's why you're the guinea pig. So right click on the image and save as. I'm going to save to. Oh. Thank you. 
Okay, so the assignment for the students is I want you to go out and I want you to find a bicycle safety video. One that's really, really good. It teaches uh, young children how to be safe on bike. Any questions so far as we go through? Mm -hmm. So it's the picture and then your overlay. Yeah. All right, so you would have had to download the video. So you, would, you need to download your video, and then so you have your video on your desktop, you have your picture on your desktop. Now we're going to get a more so we can ask So you have a target image, you have a, you have a um, an overlay, so here's the, our details, our name, the bike, the triggering image. So how many of you are in um, elementary or high school, K-12 education, I guess, is that most of them? So I don't know, if are you teachers or technologists or both? A little bit of both. So what I'm thinking of, because I know that, so my other hat in my life is that I'm also a mom and I'm involved in my son's school. Can you envision either yourself or your colleagues doing this? It's a real question in terms of, like, would they would they do it? Do you think there'd be a generational shift? Do you think it'd be too much? My problem with all this is, is the technology getting in the way really the content? Because if you just have a link that you can do, you'd be generous. Right, and right. If no. I met someone on a time, yep. educated kids, to keep his interest, we've got all these bells and whistles like a car, you have cruise control and all this stuff. And it's like a dog running after a car. Once you catch the car, what do you do with it? And is it of value, a marketable skill to someone to go out to the real world? That's what I, I No, it's, and I think it's a fair question. So, so that you have a, it, videos are passive. They're just as passive as reading. So they are they aren't on themselves engaging. So especially at the college level, you find a lot of people like, oh, what I can use videos. So what? They're not engaging. You have to, the way I look at videos is I use two tools. One is I have students make videos, so they're engaged in the content, they're the creators. And then I use a tool called Edpuzzle, which is free, which stops the video. You can overlay content, so you can talk a comment, but you can do a quiz in it. And so they're stopping, and you have to take reading notes and things like that. So they're never, ever just watching a video or doing activities through the video, just like I would have them if they were reading. Um, but I think you're right. I think a lot of times, um, especially early adopters like me, we get very excited about the technology. And we're like, woo, virtual worlds, let's go. Let's all go to Second Life. And then the students get confused because they think their grade is tied to, can I use my smartphone the right way? Can I use the, you know, they, they don't remember that this is a writing class. 
this is a reading and writing class, this is a 400 level literature class, the grade has nothing to do with the technology, and has everything to do with the writing. So the teacher has to really be the balance beam there. And um, I find that that doesn't happen all the time. You know, it's either one or the other. So I think it's a valid point, but it's that's the individual instructor to make sure the balance exists. I just was noticing online, I, I kind of came through eight school, that it was hard for me to hold it still enough to keep the you image. Know, can you change that in the program? I mean, if I'm using this for first graders and they're trying to hold this one of our tablets very, very still over an image, the video stopped every time I moved it slightly. So I'm not sure if you can stop it. It has to see the trigger points in order to play. Um, so I don't think that, you know, I think maybe you could, the bigger the picture is, the harder it is for your screen to, to size it, because you have to stand further away from it to get it in, in the screen. So I think that, I think that our, our teachers would like to use it, but I, I can see the potential for frustration with kids holding something who don't have the best motor control, right. or with any of our uh, special needs students who might not be able to hold it, you know, perfectly still to watch the rest of the video or to have it go to the and it's important for me to make them short videos. Earth the Turtle is a pretty long video, but I wouldn't necessarily use that video because it is so long and you do have to like kind of stand there like, why not just watch the movie? You know, you know, why do this fun thing? So um, I think it would be engaging, but I can see the potential that you know, every time you flinch, it stops. And right. someone's trying to focus on whatever. And the, like I said, you don't have to use a video, you can right. use or whatever. You know, like if I were working with younger kids, I might do like a, a color hunt with them. So they go over to something, like they go to a Red Sox, and, or they go to uh, you know, something that's red, they hover over chocolate and says, go find red crayon. Or you know, right. a crayon, hover over chocolate, you know, the color is this red. So I might use it that way, so they're not actually having to hold it that long. Um, for the turtles, very good. Did you, you have a follow-up comment? Well, if you are familiar with this stuff, but the average, say, professor has been teaching this way for years and they want to change. Uh, there is the Diocese of Knowledge, a Catholic school organization. They have these nuns that are very good at the rosary, the stations of the cross. They have the content, but they don't know how to deliver it using the technology. So that's a big problem. Uh, you know, I work with three of the travelers. CEOs that are using distant learning, video conferencing, put these multi-million dollar deals together, but they're focusing on getting that account. They need the support of people like you to make them successful. So that's a big problem. The change, too. These suckers don't want to change. It's a very big, um, it's a very big gap. Yeah. And we have a lot of senior faculty who will never do this. But so if you do it for a child, it's going to go out in the real world. You know, I work for Utah, I work for Eastern Connecticut State University, and I see, you know, we're making a lot of money with the tuition. They have the power phones. They can't get a job because it's not a marketable skill. It's a lot of fluff. But well, most I'll CEOs don't want fluff. They want the job done. So, so let me, so this is just one app. So when I did teach, I used AR Toolkit. Yeah, I used that too. Yeah, AR Toolkit. So I took a Google image, kids did a, a CAD image, and then in SketchUp, and they threw it on Google Earth, and you're able to take that Google Earth image, put it, print out, print out something, go up to um, a document camera, and look at it in 3D in real time. So I remember I did something at, um, Central, and I printed out, I, I basically did the building that we were in, and I showed it in front of the class, and I have a civil engineer friend who used AutoCAD, right? So he has to do that stuff. That stuff is already kind of built in, and he's just one, like, the kids graduating have to have that stuff, have to know about that thing. So th this might be a rise, but I find this very buggy to use. I mean, honestly, uh, algebra, my, our algebra teachers try to use it, and with Chromebooks, and it's great for scavenger hunts, but um, it was really, but the, it's the concept. It's the thing at UConn, you go around the different trees, and you can use an app, and then it tells you what the tree is, 
they, they, they did all the trees that I think some of the buildings at UConn using augmented reality. So it's not, this, this, this app is, I mean, this might be some guys in their basement doing this app at, at one point and they're trying to expand and things like that, but I think if we teach the kids the concept of, of what it is, and that's, that's where your marketable skills will come in. Right. This is just one thing, and yeah. they are a toolkit now, like you can show them in 3D and they can look at their, what they've built, and then you can print that out and on a 3D printer. Yeah. So, you know, that's a, the AR toolkit is really awesome because that's, you know, they're creating, they're looking at their builds, and then they're building them, actually physically building them. So now time. Now it's time. time. So, so if you want to, I know, I want to, I want to keep, this is a great dialogue and that's why we're here today. So I don't want to cut that off, but I also want to let Mark have a chance to. Yeah, Mark, you don't want me to take all your turn. <laughs> Yes, and if, and if we didn't think that you know this was successful enough, then, then no problem because you could do create a virtual reality tour, and that's going to be really accessible for everybody. Yeah, think, but I think it's cool stuff. But so again, um, this is just one of the ways that I try to incorporate universal design into my classes. If anybody has any questions, you can know, contact me or talk to me later about this or any of the things that I talked about today. That's my contact information. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Very much.
have a fun time for four years. What this means is that we can take great risks. This is the great fun of being spoiled rotten, is that because we have laurels to rest on, we can take risks, we can do fun things. So I don't know if any of you have had a chance to see our admissions video. Most of you probably never voluntarily watched an admissions video, some of those boring video content in the world. Uh, so five years ago, we created a sort of send up cheeky musical admissions video. It's been viewed over 1.6 million times online, and our visitors uh, in house see it. We were also an early adopter for the virtual tour, and we worked with a uh, vendor called UVisit to create one of their first college virtual tours. What this allows you to do is on your desktop or your mobile device to uh, experience uh, a sort of succession of images that would be as if you were taking a tour. It's led by a real Yale tour guide who made a video in front of a green screen with a script. And uh, she and other tour guides walk you through all sorts of beautiful campus spaces. Uh, part of that uh, process of creating that tour involved creating some great 360 virtual panoramas of campus. And again, since most of you have been to campus, you know those are, that's just pretty awesome content. And so we've loved featuring that in the virtual tour space. We have over 300,000 people who have taken our tour since we launched it. And it's just been a great product for, it, for us. You visit likes us because they know that we're spoiled rotten, uh, which means that we are happy to try new things for them. And so they, not, not our office, they realized that they could put their content that they've done for over 300 colleges now inside the Oculus Rift headset. So that's why I'm here today. It is by far the most interesting thing about me for you all is that I have an Oculus Rift headset on my <laughs> desk in your head. And it gathers dust uh, pretty much uh, the entire time that I've had it for six months. I have a brother-in-law, my, my wife's uh, brother is only 16 years old, and he reams me out that I have not downloaded any games, I have not done anything fun with it, I've been very busy with the last admission cycle. But what I have been able to do is to feature the Yale College Virtual Tour inside the Oculus Rift headset, which is really, really cool. There's just no other adjective to describe it, it's just really cool. The technology is awesome, and um, actually matching that technology up with a beautiful Gothic campus uh, it would seem really strange, it is perfect. Uh, it is totally immersive and it's remarkably intuitive. So the technology itself is exciting. And obviously sticking Yale's campus inside of it is a really cool thing in the future. And so uh, you visit said, Yale would be into this. Why don't we give them an Oculus Rep headset? Why don't we try to create lots and lots of buzz about the way that um, our content is a great fit for this platform? And so we said, sure, we get a free Oculus Rep headset out of it. Uh, sign us up for it. Now, of course, there are not actually in our outreach uh, sort of uh, typical work, there's, there aren't a lot of ways that we can use this, right? We're doing typically public information sessions in rooms that are larger than this. Um, I like to talk to rooms that have 400, 500 prospective students in it. If I were just to throw an Oculus Rift headset out into the audience, there would be, you know, a riot and the machine would get broken. Um, and so we really had to think about what's the right place to use this. And ironically, the best place for us to use it is on campus. And I'll give you a great example. This, uh, these are all pictures from the big premiere of the Oculus Rift headset. It was our premier on-campus visit program. So I said I spent all the month of April trying to convince our <coughs> unit students that they need to spend four years at Yale and not spend four years at Stanford, which is seen as a pretty tech uh, forward place, not spent four years at Princeton, not spent four years at Harvard or at MIT. And so uh, the very first day of this program, it's a three-day program, we have over 2,000 visitors who are here, students bring their parents, the whole campus rolls out the red carpet. It was the rainiest day of the spring by far. It was horrible. And the first thing you typically do when on our video student program is you take a tour. And our tour guides are out there, we had 1,800 ponchos that we gave to folks, they braved the elements that went out there. But we also had the Oculus Rift headset available inside our registration area. And what I loved about this is we didn't have to advertise it. We didn't have to have a sign. People just walked by and said, what is that? Oh, that's, that's, that's the Oculus Rift headset, isn't it? And we said, yeah, yeah, put it on, put it on. And these are just some of the reactions that people had uh, while they were in it. We had great fun sort of capturing their experience. And again, I wish that I uh, could have brought it with you. It is simply just really, really so what does this all mean for, for us in higher ed? What does it mean for uh, you all in technology, or especially those of you in K-12? 
K-12 technology. Um, I would argue, and actually the folks that you visit would argue as well, we probably don't have a huge um, sort of market for this in our direct outreach work. Like I said, I'm talking to rooms of 400, 500 prospective students and it, that single piece of technology is not going to that I'm probably going to take on the road with me, even to spaces like college fairs. It just doesn't scale up that piece of technology all that well. Their model, their vision, which I think is exactly the right one, is to think about it in the K-12 space. <coughs> so imagine in your high schools across Connecticut where you've got this great network and you can connect to broadband really well, your students could do virtual visits of colleges all around the world. If a high school in Singapore were to have the same technology, those students could do a virtual tour of Yale's campus in an immersive environment without having to leave Singapore. Now, I have a big disclaimer on this, and in all the media press that I've done for this and how supportive I've been and said over and over again, it's just really, really cool because it is. I still believe that there's no substitute for the college visit. So those of you with high school students in Connecticut, please tell them to come down to New Haven still. Uh, don't just strap on a headset because there are some elements of uh, the colleges that you can't replicate in that space. I do, however, think that there are great uh, opportunities. So the challenge is obviously single user interface is going to keep it from scaling, at least from my perspective, where I'm reaching out to tens of thousands of students around the world. Um, it is an early doctors only uh, piece of technology right now. This is not going to be available to the public until, I forget if it's Q2 or Q3 of 2016. There's, there's some time before it is even available to buy. It is probably going to be pretty costly. There is this big question of whether that piece of technology itself, Oculus, is going to be as bad. Uh, and it has been wildly successful. It has gotten a lot of buzz because it is so much better than the virtual reality experiences that have been out there. But it's not the only player in the field already. And you visit knows this, fortunately, and they are designing their software for multiple platforms. And again, it's not going to replace the magic of the campus visit. I do think there's great opportunities at secondary schools. That's where I would love to see that technology actually live and then our content be available in those spaces. Great opportunities to earn international outreach. Um, and everyone who's in this space right now, I think, recognizes that just the 360 sort of still image is just the beginning of this. Um, I had a meeting two days ago with them to talk about developing a 360 video. Uh, that they want to actually work with our development office for donors. So, you know, one idea, we've got a big campus construction project going on right now. We could actually show their donors in a video that they would be immersive for them um, what their money is building right there. And I would love to actually have some interactive um, elements in this. So it's really cool to have, you know, a high school in Singapore with a virtual reality headset where you could look at the Beinecke Library at Yale. Wouldn't it be even cooler, though, if you're a high school student in Singapore with a virtual reality headset who's talking live with some of our students in the admissions office, or maybe who are taking you around on a tour in real time. I think that's well within the realm of possibility for this technology. And obviously, I think that we could reach new audiences that would never be able to visit in the first place. Again, for all the reasons that are on the challenging side, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. But again, I'm in a space where I'm spoiled rotten. And so we have had great fun with this. And I have to say, the, the technology and the connection between the technology and the content was further along than I ever imagined. And so when the folks from the company just came to my office with a headset and said, just put this on, and suddenly I was in the Beinecke Library, which I could just walk to, of course, three blocks you know, down in my office. But suddenly I was there. It was, again, so cool that I said, yeah, we need to, we need to have some fun with this. So, who knows where it's going to go. We love being the guinea pig. We love being spoiled rotten. And uh, hopefully it is something that sort of uh, trickles out into the larger marketplace and has some relevance for, um, I think, especially the K-12 uh, world uh, to, to visit all kinds of different spaces wherever you are. That's all I got. We'd love to hear questions. And uh, if we want to just uh, have uh, Beth and me up, maybe we can question about anything at all. Good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it is. And, and that actually would be, I think, the cool scale, scalable piece, right? Um, and that is something I could easily imagine, again, the, the scale, I, I, don't, I couldn't imagine ever sending out, say, 60,000 Google Cardboard pieces to all the students who receive our viewbook. 
but 2,000 Google Cardboards that are a couple bucks a piece to our admitted students. Yeah, yeah exactly. Have, have Yale branded, have Yale Class of 2020 branded all over it with some simple instructions, download this app, you know, and, and that's something that I could send to Shanghai tomorrow and that student could actually have that experience right there. Yeah. Is everybody familiar with Google Cardboard? <laughs> no. It's yeah, it's a great, it's, it's, uh, it's actually, I think, I, it's, it is the way that this kind of technology is, uh, can be scaled. So I said the Oculus Rift headset itself is, uh, is amazing, it's really immersive, they've done fabulous work with the optics. Google Cardboard is a remarkably sort of simple way to get that similar experience without all the technology in it. It uses the accelerometer in your phone. You download an app, it takes that same content, you stick the phone literally into a piece of cardboard that uh, is essentially a little headset, and you move your head around like you had a pair of goggles on, uh, but instead you're just putting this piece of cardboard up against your face. And that movement very easily excel uh, translates into the accelerometer in your phone, just like it would in the Oculus Rift headset. It's not exactly the same, but it is a different way of using your phone. It's a different way of experiencing something like a 360 panorama. And it is also really cool. <laughs> and it only costs a couple bucks to, uh, to manufacture something like that and get your branding uh, all over it.